in Jesus' name, amen. Who's your greatest enemy? <laughs> I heard all the, because <laughs> you already got the people coming to your mind. Some of you got, some of you got your boss on your mind. Some of you, some of you got sports teams on your mind. Some of you got in-laws on your mind. Hello. Don't say it too loud because the families are here for baby dedication. Don't nudge your spouse. But the question still remains. So, you know, try not to give it away with your face who that enemy is. But who are your greatest enemies? It's not a question to ask a bunch of really happy, nice Christians, isn't it? I was in a, I did a little business seminar in December, kind of leading into 2024. And the guy who was leading the seminar, it was like this whole business planning workshop, an all day thing. And he had just written a book called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. And so that was kind of like the theme of this, of this thing. And you know, he's a Christian, but it wasn't really like a Christian business workshop. That wasn't how it was marketed. And so he asked everybody who was in this workshop, who is the enemy that you're, that you're fighting against this year? And honestly, as a guy who, if I don't shower and put gel in my hair, I wake up looking like Sid the Sloth. I'm not very intimidating. I'm like, I don't really have enemies. Like, my MO in life isn't to have enemies. Is that anybody else's MO in here? No, you see, what God's done in my life, my motivation is for other people to experience God's best in their lives. That's who we are as a church. And whether you've seen some of my content online, or I, there's probably people who are like, really, you don't want enemies? Like, with the stuff that you're saying, looks like you're trying to pick a fight. Like, no, honestly, that's not my heart at all. My desire is to simply preach the word of God, the truth that sets people free. Because who the Son sets free is free in. That's my motivation. Now, can I miss the mark? Sure. Can I stumble? Can, can pride get the best of me? I hope it doesn't, but, you know, I'm human. Nevertheless, my goal is not to pick a fight with enemies. I don't, I don't want enemies. But this is what the Holy Spirit said to me as I was doing this workshop. He said, Cap, you might not want enemies, but your enemies want you. And I was like, what? <laughs> what does that mean? And what he showed me was, you know, we as Christians, our goal is not to go and like pick fights with people. However, we need to understand that we are in a spiritual battle. Whether you like it or not, let me tell you, Christianity is not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And you were enlisted into a battle. And you were either on the enemy's team, you were a prisoner of war on the enemy's team, or you're in the kingdom of light. There is no middle ground. So my goal today is to like put some defibrillators to some people and say, guys, we got to wake up. We are in a battle whether we like it or not, and we have an enemy. Multiple. Now, the enemy, some of you like your testosterone's like, like, come on, Cap, tell me who my enemies are. I've been waiting all week for this. Like, no, 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 we're not doing, w, this isn't WWE church, this is love church, so we're not doing that. But let me tell you, our enemy, the Bible says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers, and powers in the unseen realm. Our fight is a spiritual fight, y'all. And so let me tell you, you gotta remove that boss from your, from your mind. Remove that politician from your mind. We wrestle not against people, but against spirits. And let me tell you, because, hey, I've been there. I get mad about what's happening in the world all the time. But I got to remember that the person that I'm offended by isn't actually my enemy. They're a prisoner of war of my enemy. And so instead of condemning and judging and, and breaking down people that God actually paid a high price to set free, I got to set my crosshairs off of the person who is being used by my actual enemy. So who are my enemies? Lord, I... Who are my enemies? I have a long list now after the Lord told me that. I'll tell you some things that I hate. I hate poverty. Anyone here love poverty? Good. I was like, <laughs> so I got to get someone to talk back to me about hating poverty. I hate poverty because I see how poverty destroys generations. I see that in my father's kingdom, there is no poverty. I see how in the Garden of Eden, there was no poverty. I see in the New Jerusalem, there will be no poverty. I see that in my father's kingdom, the streets are paved with gold. There's more than enough for everybody and everybody gets a mansion. I hate poverty. 
I hate poverty. I want to see, I want to see poverty destroyed in our city. I want to see poverty destroyed in North Omaha. I want to see, I want to see Christians come out of a poverty mindset that keeps them coming from coming to church, joining a small group, reading the word of God, going to prayer meetings because they got to go get the bag. No, that's a poverty mindset. And our God says that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all of our needs will be met. He is a good father and he is a provider and God hates poverty. I hate sickness. I hate sickness. Sickness ran through my home for the past couple of years. It's still running through my home. I thank God that he paid a mighty price on that cross to destroy the works of the devil, but we're still working through some things. I know what he paid for, but we're, I'm telling you, that enemy is still rearing its head up in our home, and I hate sickness. I hate miscarriage. I know a family in this church who just had a or maybe their fourth miscarriage over the past couple weeks. They thought this was the one. Hate death. Hate prodigal living. I hate sin. I hate it all. I hate it all. But you know what's one enemy that we don't give enough credit to? Religion. Today's message is titled Killer Religion. You see, what happens with religion, religion is this nasty spirit that comes up to derail and to diffuse and to destroy any work of God. The spirit of religion hates the move of God. Anybody grateful for the momentum we're experiencing in this house? Like anybody feel it? Anybody see it? Week to week? Droves of people getting saved, people getting healed and delivered, people coming out of addiction, marriages getting restored. I love the momentum of God. We're in a move of God right now. Put your sail up because the wind of the Holy Spirit is blowing through this church. And we're just getting started. But let me tell you, the spirit of religion hates the move of God. And the spirit of religion will do whatever it can to stop the move of God happening in your life and through your life. And I'm here to tell you today that Jesus paid too high of a price for us to give in to that dead spirit because he made us alive in the resurrection. He gave us a new hope. Let me tell you, there's people in this place that you've given your life to Jesus and the, the pattern, the theme of your life, the brand of your life right now is weariness, is obligation, is not measuring up. Let me tell you, he who was the word of God became sin that you might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I declare over you today, freedom in the house of God, freedom over your soul, that you are free from the toils of religion. Can anybody receive that today? Is anybody grateful? Now, when we're talking about religion, I want, I want to be really clear. The Bible talks about religion, and the Bible talks about religion in a good way. And here's where it talks about religion in a good way. James chapter 1, verse 27 says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Yeah. 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 Michelle's excited. <laughs> Come on. So what is the spirit of religion? What's the difference? The spirit of religion wants to condemn you and weigh you down with rules that God never gave you. The spirit of religion wants to divide the church over stupid arguments, worthless arguments. The spirit of religion wants to castrate the church and keep us from walking in supernatural power. The spirit of religion wants us to pursue rightness at the expense of righteousness. And that devil is pesky because that devil looks really good on the outside, but on the inside, it's just whitewashed tombs. Jesus had a bout with this enemy. You see, Jesus had enemies. Yeah, Jesus had enemies. Jesus wasn't just this like hippie with flowing hair and uh, flowers and tambourine in one hand, ukulele in the other, kazoo hanging out of his mouth. No, like he, <laughs> that's a really funny picture. But some of us have that picture of him. And he was like, you know, and that honestly, what's interesting is that's the picture that the world has of him. But Jesus was all love, man. And love is 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 love. Like, what does that even mean? I don't even know. But this is the picture that the world paints of who Jesus is, that he's accepting and tolerating of everything. He's a friend to everyone. He's okay with whatever you want to do. Whatever your truth is all good. 
Let me tell you, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And he said clearly, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Now, again, Brutus with the testosterone. Chill out a little bit. What Jesus was saying was he was, I'm calling, I'm, I have come to separate the sheep from the goats. I've come to separate my people from the world and to restore them back to the original identity that God prepared for them and intended for them in the Garden of Eden, that they would be a righteous people, that they'd be a holy people, bought with my blood and filled with my Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus came to do. And when Jesus walked around, yeah, who, someone's excited about that. Praise God. Jesus went around healing the sick, casting out devils, raising the dead, preaching the good news, multiplying bread and fish. He was a party. Jesus was a party. Jesus was a good time. He is the God of joy. And you know what was interesting was the people, the, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the heathen, they weren't the ones who were upset at Jesus. It was the religious people. Matthew 22, we're going to get into it right now. Jesus is having a fun little cozy dialogue with these people called the Pharisees and the Sadducees who are trying to derail, destroy, and ultimately stop the work of God, the move of God that's happening through Jesus. There's three things I want you to write down. The religious spirit kills confidence. Someone say confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence in the flesh? No. The spirit of religion thrives off of confidence in the flesh, confidence in our own good works. The spirit of religion specifically kills our confidence in the finished work of Jesus and in the word of God. It wants to confuse you. The second thing that it does is it kills power. Someone say power. power. The spirit of religion has a goal to kill the power of God moving in and through you. And number three, the spirit of religion kills love. Someone say love. love. Let's start with number one. Matthew 22, verses 15 through 22. It says, then the Pharisees went and plotted how they, they might entangle him in his talk. If you're reading the NLT, it might say the word trap. Whether you're reading the New King James or ESV, whatever word that says, whether it's entangle, trap, or it's a synonym, please circle that. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians saying, teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God and truth, nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. So they're trying to flatter him at this point. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. You see, they were trying to catch him in a, in a gotcha moment and said, why do you test me, you hypocrites? <laughs> I love that. Because we think of Jesus like nice Jesus. Now, Jesus is about to pull out the punches with these guys. Calls it straight to their face. Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. Someone say entangled. Here's what I've discovered about the spirit of religion. You see, the Bible is not complicated. I'm gonna say it again. The Bible is not complicated. God is not confusing. He is not the author of confusion. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You know who's confusing? The devil's confusing. The world is confusing. And so what the devil will do is if he can't get you in adultery, if he can't get you in you know, drugs, meth, whatever. You know what he'll do? He will get you in legalism. The spirit of lawlessness is very different from the spirit of legalism. Lawlessness scratches out the word of God. It's as if there is no law to follow. But the spirit of religion or the spirit of legalism adds to God's word. Twist it. Watch what it says right here. I'm gonna go to Deuteronomy chapter four, verse two. It says, do not add to what I command you and do not subtract from it, but keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. Here's what I've discovered. If we as a people would come back to the simplicity of what God's word says, we will fall in love with this thing. We'll fall in love with God. We'll look at ourselves and, and, and we'll, give, we'll give ourselves grace. We'll give other people grace. We'll walk in a supernatural power. It's when we start adding things to this 
that God never said that we have some serious problems. Can I give you an example? In the story of creation, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates Adam and Eve, first man and first woman. He gives them one command. He says, eat from, the, eat from everything that you see in the garden, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for if you do, you shall surely die. I want to show you an example of what the spirit of lawlessness looks like. Do we have that scripture? Spirit of lawlessness looks like this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, cross out the part you don't like. That's how a lot of the world lives. I'll take all of the benefits of the kingdom without the king, without the rule to follow. But the spirit of legalism, let me tell you, it's not any better. It's another ditch that so many people go into. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, should say, nor touch. Nor touch. Does that sound familiar? Who said that? Eve said that. Do you remember what happened? The serpent came to Eve and said, did God really say the spirit of religion? That's its number one M.O. in your life and in my life. It's to question our confidence in the simplicity of God's word. The provision that we have everything that we need in Christ Jesus, that he is not holding out on us. But he's given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. And if he would not withhold his own son from us, why would he withhold any good thing from us? But the spirit of religion wants to add to the word. So Eve says, we shall not eat nor touch. A lot of people like to add their own opinions, their own tradition on top of the word and then condemn themselves for it because God never gave you the grace to do something he never told you to do. And then what's worse, we confuse other people in the process but I'm believing that God is doing a miraculous work in his church right now. Where we're becoming a people that say, God, we're done with the man-made tradition. We're done with the opinion of my pappy and my, my grandma and even that pastor. God, I thank you that you give me access to hear from your throne room myself. Amen. That this word is clear. Yeah. And your will for me is to have abundant life. Following Jesus is not a begrudging obligation. It's an invitation to life. Can I get an amen from somebody in the house of God right now? It kills our confidence in God's word. Number two, the religious spirit, it kills power. Chapter 22, verse 23 through 29 says, the same day the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, these people, by the way, the Sadducees, what's the difference between them and the Pharisees? The Sadducees, don't believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in the working of the Holy Spirit. They didn't believe in miracles. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in uh, spirits or angels. They, they boil everything down to what they can see in black and white text with their own two eyes. They walk by sight and not by The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Hold on tight, because this is a very confusing little riddle that they're trying to walk him through. Now, there were with us seven brothers. The first died and he had married that he had, uh, the first died after he had married and having no offspring left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also and the third, even to the seventh. So this picture is like this guy marries this girl, he dies, the girl kind of goes down the line of all of the seven brothers. So they're like, what? Jesus is probably like, what are you talking about? What the smurf is this? Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. Let me tell you, I love, anyone love the Bible? Amen. Yeah, I love the word of God. I'll tell you what, I'm falling more in love with the word of God than I've ever fell in love with the word of God. Like, I am hungry for this thing because this thing is life. This is the bread of life. And the Bible promises that if I meditate on this thing day and night and actually observe to do everything that it says, that I will be successful in everything that I do. Joshua chapter one, verse eight, Psalm chapter one. This book of instruction is meant to give us life. 
Why were the people who were the greatest experts at this thing, who understood this thing from beginning to end, how could they miss the move of God happening right in front of them? Let me tell you, my, my friends, this, understanding this, God has invited us into so much more than the head knowledge God doesn't want us to puff up ourselves with our intellect. He wants to transform our nature. He wants to make us a conduit for the power of heaven to flow through and bring that kingdom down to planet earth. That is the goal. That's the goal. So I will never say, let's stop reading the word. But my, oh man, this freaks me out. This freaks me out, especially a church that's so devoted to this, which is a huge blessing and an advantage. May we not be a people that despise the work of God by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We don't need less Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not weird. He's not an accessory to our relationship with God. He is everything that we need to fulfill our mission here on the planet. I'm not mad. I'm just passionate, by the way. I had an encounter this week, and I don't, my, my goal, by the way, is not to like, I don't, I don't want to take criticism that I hear and like use it as an opportunity to say, did you hear what this person said? Bleah. Like, that's just kind of lame. And I receive enough criticism where I couldn't even keep up with all of it, so I just ignore most of it. But there was a piece of criticism that I received this week that I thought was very fitting with this message. And this person said, they said it online because everyone's way more courageous behind a screen than they are in person. And this person said, I came to their church, didn't even address me personally. I came to his church and I'll tell you what, the Holy Spirit told me that the leaven of the Pharisees is in that church. In other words, like, yeah, (laughs) the religious spirit is in that church, particularly in the leadership and all all this sort of stuff. And I was like, man, I'm so glad that other people hear the Holy Spirit and when I don't, because I'm like, I was so busy preaching the word of God, worshiping Jesus, laying hands on people that needed prayer that I must have missed the voice of the Holy Spirit that day. And I'm being facetious and I don't wanna sound arrogant, but that spirit is ruthless and that spirit is condemned. And when people, I'm just telling you right now, as the, as the move of God continues to grow in this church, one thing is gonna, two things are gonna happen. One, people are going to catch the wave and they're gonna experience God move in and through them like never before. There will be signs and wonders. We will, we will have a church reputation of people bringing sick loved ones here and God healing them miraculously. I'm believing it. This is Christianity. That's gonna happen. And we're gonna either say, God, I don't fully understand, but I'm hitching myself to this wagon. And I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm hitching my wagon to this rocket ship that's more like it. I wanna go on this ride. But then there's gonna be people, frankly, and here's my heart, that nobody would fall into this camp. There'll be another group of people who see what's happening but refuse to participate in what's happening. And their only response will be to use the word of God to make an excuse for why they don't. And that is a scary place to be. That's what the spirit of religion does. 1 Corinthians 4.20 I said 420. I was hoping someone would be like, oh, what? (laughs) If you don't know what 420 is, don't go look it up. 1 Corinthians 420. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. No, come on, somebody. There ain't no high like the most high, right? That's what I'm talking about. The kingdom of God is not mere talk, is not mere word. It's the demonstration of bringing this word to life to a dead and broken world. That's what the kingdom's about. It's about me being set on fire by the Holy Spirit, you as well, because this isn't just about me on stage. You are the saints, temples of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, greater works you will do when I leave, because I will send the Holy Spirit to become your helper. Yeah. Woo. Anybody excited? A couple people over here. The power. You want to overcome the spirit of religion in your life? Walk in the power of God. How do you walk in the power of God? You simply ask, God, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit today. Use me to do what I see in this word. I'll tell you what, is it gonna be uncomfortable? You better believe, but that's why he's called the comforter. 
There's no reason for us to be comforted if we're not putting ourselves in uncomfortable positions. I'm telling you, you're gonna see it this week. People are gonna come to you at work. They're gonna say, man, like I, I'm, my back is really hurting me. My knee is out. And you're gonna be like, you're not gonna be like, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Have a nice day. Do, do, do. No, you're gonna say, and you're not gonna say, oh, I will keep you in my prayers at some point, which most of us, if we're honest, we never actually do. I will pray, praying for you, prayer emoji. No, it's an excuse for, I thought about it and then I got distracted with life and I never thought about it ever again. How about when we see the need, we meet the need? Not in a weird way, don't be like, let me let my hands on you, like just like go, like ask for permission, ask for permission. I had a guy at the gym, um, by the way, praise God for you turning your gym into a ministry, man. It's amazing. I'm really grateful for what you're doing. I allow you to absolutely murder me every single week for my training for this and for jumping up front. So I appreciate it. I appreciate all you do. There was a guy there who had an eye patch on. He had some, something really crazy with his eye. He took the time to share with me how much pain he was in. And I'm thinking, well, I have one of two decisions. I can, oh, I'm sorry to hear about that. Praying for you. I'm a man of God. I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I have God literally living inside of me. I am the solution in this moment. And I said, hey man, do you mind if I pray for you? I never thought of that. That's what he's, he's like, I would never think of that. Well, well, maybe we should think about that a little bit more. Let's pray for things. <laughs> hey, do you mind if I put my hand on your shoulder? You see how I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna pray over you very quickly but there's power in it, so here we go. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that your son paid a high price for this man's healing, and I pray that you would open up his eyes and walk out of here with clear vision in Jesus' mighty name, because you love him and you're good and there's no shifting shadow in you. Amen. That's how simple it is. Now, you might be thinking, well, did he get healed? Honestly, he didn't, I don't think he got healed in that moment, but I'm not walking by sight. I'm not walking, because what I experience, what I see happen and don't happen, it ain't changing what this word says. So for me, I'm not gonna take an experience where I don't know if it occurred the way that he said it would occur and say, oh, well, you know, that didn't really work. I'm gonna, uh, you know, scratch that out or I'm gonna put a little carrot here and say, well, maybe he doesn't always want you to do that. His word never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. I'm not gonna make this thing conform to me. I'm gonna become like this word in Jesus' name. You want to overcome the spirit of religion in your life? Choose to walk in power, and God will give you the grace. Final thing. I'm going to invite the band up as we close. The spirit of religion kills love. Oh, boy. Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Pause right there. What's, the, what's this guy doing? This guy has taken all of these commandments. Let's just even stay with the first 10, like the 10 basic commandments. And he's trying to put Jesus in a gotcha moment. Which one of these is the most important? What, you're gonna say that the other nine aren't important? It's, it's a foolish question to try to trap him. But what is Jesus' response? Jesus is so smart. I love Jesus. He's the smartest one in the room. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. <laughs> you see, what was happening was the religious leaders were using the law, they were skillfully manipulating the word of God to excuse themselves from doing the works of ministry. That's just demonic. That makes no sense. They were skillfully using their knowledge to keep them from expressing and manifesting the agape love of God to those in need. And let me tell you, spirits are eternal. Those spirits, they did not die when Jesus died. They did not die with those Pharisees. 
They did not die with those Sadducees. Those spirits are still roaming the planet today. And every day, you and I, as blood-bought, Holy Spirit-filled believers, we have a decision to make. Will we create an open door for that spirit to enter in our life and to destroy the world around us? Or will we make war against that spirit? Because Jesus did not bring, come to bring condemnation. He came to set the captives free. I want to share with you a brief story. My wife and I, we were chatting with this young lady who's part of another church in a totally random place. And uh, she, she said this, the, the woman said this almost from a place of pride. Like she was proud of this. And she said that in their church, there was a couple who the, the man had committed adultery. Stepped outside of the marriage and did something unthinkable. And you know what the church did? They took that couple and put them in front of the entire congregation, shamed them, and then kicked them out of the church. And my wife was like, why would they do that? And she was like, well, because the word of God says so. You see, <laughs> the word of God says a lot of things. But the word of God will bring death if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit to understand God's motivation behind what he does. I'm not against church discipline. The Bible's pretty clear about church discipline, but church discipline is, is uh, primarily used for those in leadership. The Bible says, let not many of you become teachers for you shall receive a stricter judgment. That type of behavior, in my opinion, is more appropriate for someone who is called to be an under shepherd because their, their role is to say, follow me as I follow Christ. And so to bring that type of humiliation can be important to cleanse the body and bring the fear of God upon the church. But I'm just thinking, you, are you serious? Ugh! I hate that devil. I hate that spirit. Because I'm thinking of people who by the grace of God walked through very similar things, who came to this church thinking, if there's a God who's merciful, if there's a God who can restore, maybe it's Jesus. And if this church is called Love Church, maybe they can love us through this mess. I'm telling you, man, what would happen if our first response to somebody who's stuck in the most difficult scenario isn't to cast judgment, but to seek to restore them. What would happen to this city? What would happen to this city? It reminds me of the story of the woman caught in adultery. Similar, same exact scenario. Woman caught in adultery, Pharisees find her. They don't find the husband, they just bring her. Last time I checked, it takes two to tango. They bring the woman caught in adultery and they are holding their stones. They're ready to stone her. And Jesus says, he starts, he starts drawing something in the sand. And he says, he who has no sin, let him cast the, fir the first stone. And we don't know what he wrote, but scholars submit that as he's writing, because as he's writing, the Pharisees are reading what he's writing and one by one, they drop their stones and they walk away. Scholars would say that Jesus, the Son of God, operating by the word of knowledge, is reading their mail and is writing down all of the sins that they've committed. And they're, they're confronted with the reality of their own imperfection and realize, who am I to pull the splinter out of somebody else's eye when I got a big old plank in mine? They walk away and then the woman caught into a, an adulteress looks up at Jesus and Jesus says to her, my love, where are your accusers? They all disappeared. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. Grace is not a license to sin. Don't hear me say that. I love holiness. God loves holiness. Grace is the enablement for us to live the life that you and I were always predestined to live. Grace is the power of God coming upon a person who is unworthy of forgiveness and God saying, I'm not gonna leave you in that state. I'm gonna change your nature and give you the power to walk and do the works of God in your life. 
This is grace. Grace changes everything. And my friends, I'm going to read one final scripture for you. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Come on, somebody. Anybody grateful for the grace of God today? I want you to stand to your feet as we close. I'm going to make this an interesting moment. I feel so, some people are kind of like, honestly, some people are probably so bound by the spirit of religion, even in this moment, that you're having difficulty receiving this word. You're making excuses for why not to receive this word. And let me tell you, I'm not going to shame you in this place. And I would ask you, if you're, if I understand if you got things to do, but we're in the house of God. And if there's people that come forward and need prayer, need ministry, I would ask that you would respect them and honor them if, if you can. If you gotta go, I understand. But let's not make this an opportunity just to kind of get out and, and miss the power of God at work. This is why we're here. And if you're in this place today, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, we'll figure out how to work through this. But Holy Spirit is, he has a way of kind of putting the fish into the right buckets. Here's what I want to do. I want to pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit over people today. Because God has given you this amazing gift to walk in a supernatural power, to walk in a new nature, to have clear clarity and confidence about what he's saying. God's portion for you is that you would not wander through life wondering what the will of God is, but that you would be led by his spirit. And if you're in this place today where you're like, I know a lot of religion, but I don't know a lot of Holy Spirit. I wanna pray right now that you would come forward and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If there's anybody right now